The Ed Bernstein Show. Now, here's Ed. November 8th, Election Day. It's coming up. It's coming up. You know, and you, you can't watch TV without seeing commercials for governor's race, uh, congressional races, Senate races. But sometimes they're not the most important races to many of us in town. Some of the important races involve what's going on at the university or what's going on in our state legislature. Um, a little bit later in the show, Edgar Flores, uh, state senator, will be here to talk about uh, what's going on this election cycle in the state legislature. And with me now is Stephanie Goodman, who is uh, a very you know, well-known face in, in Las Vegas, um, who is running for the Board of Regents at, uh, at UNLV. When I say well-known, now you, you worked for the mayor, Oscar I Goodman. I right? did, and, I did. And, and had a relationship, let's just disclose. Oh, well, yes, yeah. I did. I married his son, okay. and uh, we are divorced now, but we, we get along wonderfully, and mm -hmm. it's, it's great. But I did work for Oscar for about six years as his chief of staff, and before that I was always very close with Carolyn, too, so I just, I love the family. So. What does a chief of staff for a mayor do? Well, essentially, you're, I was his right hand, so uh, when he wanted to redevelop downtown, it was uh, an interesting scenario because there weren't a lot of people that were interested in developing downtown at the time. And so that was really what I, I did. I was out there, I was talking on his behalf, I was doing things at his behest, and uh, we, we, we did some great things downtown. So that was really my main thing. I'd also get thrown into situations where people are expecting Oscar to speak you know, a, a room of a thousand conventioneers and he couldn't make it and then I'd get to go and deal with that because there's nobody like Oscar. So that was always a challenge. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say, getting Oscar to speak couldn't have been that hard a task. Right, right. No. <laughs> no, never. But, but look, I, I've, I've been downtown. I've had an office downtown for 46 years. So I remember what downtown was like before Oscar became mayor. And um, it was like every year there was always talk, we're going to fix downtown, we're going to redo downtown, we're going to renovate, we're going to make it an art area, we're going to get business, we're going to attract, we're going to get, we're going to get sports teams, we're going to get, <laughs> nothing ever happens. Right. Nothing. Right? right. Then Oscar came and next thing you know, uh, Fremont Street got their act together. Uh, Circa all of a sudden starts uh, exploring on what they're going to do. All of a sudden, you know, we have a hockey team and other teams starting to come into Las Vegas. You know, he wasn't, uh, you know, primarily responsible for bringing the sports teams in, but he certainly opened that door. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, he 100 percent opened And he talked about it, and everyone said he was nuts, too. But right. he always believed that for us to be a world-class city, we needed to have that professional sports element. So that was a big piece. And then also uh, the health care piece, uh, you know, the fact that uh, he and uh, Larry Ruvo were able to bring uh, the Cleveland Clinic out oh, here so right. that they could yeah. be a part of the Lou Ruvo Brain Health Center. It's, it's amazing. So it was the start of everything. That's, it really that's started what, that's all what it of started, it. started, right? Yeah. And, 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 and all of a sudden there's a building going on. There's a Smith Center. I mean, there's it like... It was really incredible, yeah. but it was a... And, and it's something I kind of want to use in this, if I, if I get this position in, in, uh, the, you know, as a regent. What we did is it, it was uncanny because we would go out there. We didn't act like uh, uh, the public sector. We acted like the private sector. So um, I was out there talking to people, talking about downtown, talking about this huge piece of land that we had, 61 acres, and shouldn't you be a part of this? And so... I, I'd like to apply some of that, uh, I don't know, thinking out of the box, getting out of your silos, talking to one another. I'd like to apply some of that to the region position as well. So now you decided to get in, involved in politics. Well, why did you choose to run for uh, Board of Regents at, at, U, at UNLV? Well, oddly enough, I've always thought that was just a wonderful position. I think you can affect so much positive change. Um, I was the first woman elected as student body president at UNLV. Shelley Berkeley was the first woman, but she wasn't elected. She was vice president, became the president. But um, I was the first woman elected, and I remember working with the Board of Regents. It was the year that uh, Kenny Gwynn took that uh, position as the president for a dollar a year. I learned so much f from him. I learned so much from the Regents. It was Maddie Graves. It was uh, Shelley Berkeley, Carolyn Sparks, Jill Derby, all of these really incredible people in our community who just wanted to give back and make the university system better. 
And I, I, I think that the regions, I'd, I'd like to take it back there. And I actually think they've kind of gotten a bad rap. I, there's a lot of incredible people on that board. And I would just like to be a part of, of the solution and try to, to make it even better. So that's why I ran. I just, right. I think you can affect positive change. And I, I, I do love Nevada. I'm a native Nevadan. Just want to make a difference. What, what, what knowledge or experience can you take from being the chief of staff for the mayor of Las Vegas into a region job? Well, for one, uh, I used to have to often sit in meetings and uh, bring people together. Obviously, in politics, not everybody's seeing things the same. And I remember one time we were all in a meeting, and someone I respect very much said, Stephanie knows how to just get everybody to talk about the right thing and move forward. And, and I, I, it's, listen, I don't have a lot of talents, but that's one of them. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really able to sit across from somebody. It's actually something I enjoy has a completely different opinion than I do and just say why do you feel this way and if you could just find those little common threads you can build a bridge you can come to consensus and right now I feel it's vital for individuals to to talk to one another to listen to one another if you're running for politics uh, you can't sit over here and 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 just not want to talk not want to play you gotta you gotta sit down talk to people and and try to affect change by by listening and and coming to consensus if you had a um, magic wand and could make changes over at the university, what would they be? Better parking. <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, look, we were, we we're talking about, about that, that before the show, but it, but it's true. You yes. Know, I have a couple of my daughters uh, go to UNLV. They come every time they come back from school. They complain to me about the parking. Right. It's an extra, I don't know, half hour to an hour driving around looking for parking spots. It, it can build a new garage. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Right. right. So. Well, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's me being comical. But it's yeah. true. It is a problem, and we should look yeah. into it. Safety also is a problem, well, I'm hearing, has been as well. So there, that's right? something that needs to be looked because into. The campus, is that because the campus is so exposed, so open? Yeah, yeah. So there are things that need to be done there. But for me personally, I feel like, you know, I've, I've heard that there's a little pushback if, if you don't have the right opinion. And I don't think that's okay. I think that a university and community college campus is a place where freedom of speech should be protected. It should be a safe haven. And right now, I'm not sure that that's happening. I hear about students that are getting some pushback even um, if they're not writing the right opinion you know, with some faculty. And listen, I don't know how much of this is true, but I'd like to make sure that's not happening on any of our campuses. Um, you know, I love the state of Nevada. I love how independent we are. And this is a big piece of, of who we are, is, is making sure that we can say how we feel. As long as you're respectful to the other individual, you should be able to talk about anything on a university campus. You know, there, there's a lot of conversation politically about um, student loans, about, you know, the need for college, um, what we're getting out of college, just as, as a principle. Um, you know, because college is not for everybody. Oftentimes, people spend a lot of money, get a lot, get tremendous debt, finish college, and can't get a job. Yes. You know, so what are your thoughts about, and I, I, I don't even know, as we're sitting here today, I don't know, is, does UNLV have um, um, degrees and classes for people in trades, for instance? Um, like, I, like, recently I went to a high school in town, and um, this high school was training people to become 911 operators, police officers, army officers. I mean, to learn a skill that necessarily was different than just becoming a, you know, a, a, taking a psychology degree at, at, at the university. Right. So uh, where do you see colleges uh, going in, in that direction? Well, I think it's really important. So we have two Research One universities here, right? So UNR and UNLV, both Research One universities, right. which is a huge accomplishment, really, really great for our state. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have the varied community colleges. And I think that that there's, and this is kind of what I'm talking about, getting out of your silos and talking. So let's take, for instance, you have Elon Musk that came here, built this, you know, gigafactory in Sparks. You know, the state gave him a great deal to come here, which is fine. At the same time, rather than maybe him writing a check to the university system, how about he invests in our state and he develops a, a robotics program at Truckee Meadows Community College and then mm -hmm. what we're able to do is we're able to funnel those students into the Gigafactory and they have this great uh, training in robotics and I think that's kind of what we need to do. I, I, it's, it's imperative for us as we, as we move forward if we're going to diversify our economy, we need to do things like that. We need to 
essentially talk to industry, figure out what different economic development departments are doing, who they're bringing in, and then how can we make sure that our students are ready for that and, and, and get them either trained or get them you know, a, a certificate or get them the diploma that they need to be able to work in that industry. I, it's, it's not that hard. I think we just, higher education needs to talk with economic development departments, needs to talk with industry and figure out what do we bring into this state so we can make sure that we are we have we have the talent to be able to take those jobs. It seems like the old you know cart in front of the horse uh, type of thing. You know where a lot of these businesses are reluctant to come into Las Vegas because we don't have the expertise, the the uh, you know the uh, educated um, um, workforce that they're looking for. But on the flip side, um, how do you get it if you don't have, um, you know, business investing in some of the, you know, lessons that, that we're trying to, in some of the education that we're trying to obtain? We had a lot of the same issues when we were trying to redevelop downtown. You know, it's like, do you, do you build a stadium and then they uh, will come? Yeah. Or, I mean, it was that whole issue as well. So I, I think that we need to do what we can right now. Industry is coming to this state. So if we can make sure that, you know, the architect that can't hire anybody because there's no architects that, he, that, that need a job right now, this is nuts. We need to make sure that we're making the industry that's here and the industry that's coming in, it's just conversations to make sure we have the programs available. So you've you got to start somewhere. And I do think, you know, an, another problem with industry coming here is our, you know, clearly our K through 12 education. You know, we are so poor. We, it's sad how, how poor we are in our state, in, in Southern Nevada specifically, with regard to that. So uh, that needs to be worked on as well, but uh, I'm not running for that office. I'm up here at the you know the higher yeah. education space. But you are, you are running for an office that has a board, right? So getting along with the other board members and, uh, and working together, I mean, that's an important function of, of this job. Yes, yes, and it's, yeah. it's vital. It's vital. It's vital in Washington, D.C. I mean, it's vital for us to be able to talk to one another and um, you know I I think if you if you have an issue with somebody you got to look them in the eye you got to tell them what the problem is and you've got to figure out you know is is there any thread here that can make this work and and even if there isn't and you agree to disagree um, having that respect for someone and being able to talk to them and, and speak to them you're, you're maintaining that relationship for the next issue that comes up so it's 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 vital Look, I mean, when I moved here, UNLV did not have the best reputation. If, at, it, it, you know, it, it was a basketball school, you know, at, yeah. at one time. But over the years, it's really, you know, worked hard to develop. We, out of nowhere, we, we created a law school, which is a shining star within the, the legal world. Mm -hmm. We created a, um, a medical school, which I'm hopeful will become similar to the law school, what the law school has yes. become. What are your your thoughts about that? Listen, I think it's wonderful that we have a medical school here. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of issues about the fact that, um, you know, the North always gets more than the South, and, and I'm just so happy that we have a medical school here, and I think they've been so smart about it. And so I know that there have been issues there as well. There's been controversy there as well, but really what we need to do is um, we need to strive to make those schools as good as they can be, and, and we need to take all of the politics out. When the media is talking about UNLV, they need to be talking about all the great things that the medical school is doing, you know, all, all the graduates that the, the, the law school has, and, and all of the research programs, everything that's going on. They need to stop talking about the people that are supposed to be behind the scenes affecting this positive change. And so I think that's kind of where we need to take everything as well. It's, it's, it's amazing what we've done down here. I, I, when I worked for Oscar, we were trying to get a medical school down here as well, and I mean, it did not happen. So the fact that we have it here, and the fact that it is a wonderful school, and it's just gonna continue to get better, that's what's important. I agree, I agree. <laughs> and, we, and law school, by the way, has one of the best writing programs of any law school in the country. It's amazing that it's gotten I that did kind not of know that. recognition. Yeah, the writing program there is better than Harvard. That's wonderful. Yeah. Stephanie Goodman, candidate uh, <laughs> for UNLV uh, uh, Board of Regents. Yes. And uh, we'll be right back with uh, State Senator Edgar Flores. There are more and more trucks on the road, and there are so many more accidents. If you or your loved ones have been injured in a truck accident, you need to call me. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.
Edgar Flores has been an assemblyman in the Nevada legislature for a number of years. This year, he's throwing his hat in the ring for the state senate. So with me is um, Edgar Flores. Welcome, Edgar. Um, look, you've seen a, a lot of change in the, in the legislature. Um, it seems to me, just uh, as an outsider, that of all our political subdivisions, that the legislature seems to function most cohesively. Now, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe there's a lot of fighting and partisan bickering that goes on there. But it seems like you guys get stuff accomplished. I, I agree with that tone. I know when we talk about our federal delegation, they talk about how they can't even sit together in a room and have uh, coffee. Uh, I think that's very different in Nevada, and I think we have a responsibility to keep that relationship going. I would say about 90% of legislation is bipartisan in the state of Nevada. It's only about 10% where we're at odds with each other. And even then, we try to work collectively together. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the folk that surround us, not so much the elected, but we have a bipartisan staff. We have a group of folk that have been in that building for a very long time who are very uh, driven by solutions and not so much by the political brand. Yeah. What are some of the things that, that you have accomplished, uh, in the State Assembly at least, um, while you've been there that you're proud of? Sure. Well, when I first ran for office, one of the things that originally triggered me wanting to get involved in, at all was I've worked with mentoring programs for a very long time, uh, for over 15 years in, in many different capacities. And it, it was actually the youth who encouraged me to run, because what I would do is I would bring folk from the community to speak to them. And then one day they flipped it on me and said, well, why don't you run for office? You know, you're always talking about stepping up. I mention that because I came in with a, a sense of determination in helping our youth. Um, so I've worked on some juvenile justice bills, uh, particularly one that I'm very proud of that we just passed last session, is that we now have a new Miranda right uh, warning for uh, anybody under the age of 18. So we're all accustomed to when a custodial interrogation is going to start, uh, they'll say you have a right to remain silent. Anything you do or say can and will be used against you in a court of law, et cetera, et cetera. Well, with the child now, when there is going to be a custodial interrogation, there's a added language of you have a right to remain silent. What that means is you don't have to speak to me at all, and you won't get in trouble. You can have your parent here. You can have an attorney here. You don't have to pay for them. It's free. So it's just overly simplified so that these kids understand what their constitutional rights are and what they're waving away. Um, another thing that I've worked on that I was very proud of at the federal level, we have something called special immigrant juvenile status. Um, and what that is, and I'll try not to get too technical, is when a child comes to the U.S. and they've been abandoned or uh, mistreated or something happened to them in their native country, and now they're here, but, and they were, uh, that happened at the hands of their parent, one or both, when they come here, if they can get a guardianship uh, and they'll go to family court, which is why it's so important that we got involved as a Nevada State Legislature, they'll go to family court, they have to do something called a special finding. And the special finding, in essence, says it's in the best interest of the child to remain in the U.S. Uh, what was happening for a lot of years in Nevada is that j judges at the family court level were refusing to do it, mostly because they were unfamiliar with that. And so we passed legislation to make sure that we had cohesiveness and uh, uh, that the federal law was being followed at the state level. I've also worked very, very uh, closely with our schools. Uh, the very first session in uh, 2015, I, I passed a bill that helped create a roadmap in our school district. Uh, most of the kids have very little control in what they're studying, how they're studying. What, what is their routine that's necessary to get them where they want? Do you want to go to Harvard? Do you want to go to trade school? Do you want to go to UNLV? All those paths are very different academically. But now there's a, a requirement that our counselors sit down with the student, have them identify what they're trying to do, and then create a roadmap that follows them so that year after year, that child is working in that direction. And, and look, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer <laughs> that we right. would have had that, right. but, um, but, but, but I'm <laughs> glad that, that you're making it happen. You know, and you talked about um, the, the children um, with the family court judges. Because my wife and I have an, a, 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 a foundation that we work with UNLV to provide attorneys for these children. So I'm very familiar with this program. And what was happening, and it is an atrocity, what was happening is that these children would come from, I don't know, uh, look for asylum 
That's in right. Guatemala, either being uh, raped or families are being murdered, and sometimes the, the family, the parents themselves, were selling the kids to gangs in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Central or South America, and the kids would come here for asylum, and some, and, and, and as you, they would go in front of a judge, not even knowing how to speak English. Right. It was kind of a kangaroo court, mm -hmm. and um, and they could no, there, there was just no ability for these children to even plead their case. So having these family court judges, you know, hear these determinations is significantly important because oftentimes it's the living circumstance of the child that is part of the issue and why they're seeking asylum here in this country. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so having family court judges having the authority to, to make some of these rulings is really important for the kids. And I love that bill, of, uh, that, uh, um, you know, the, the, the bill you have with, uh, with the, uh, the arrest warnings because, look, you can't treat a 9-year-old the same way you're treating a 19-year-old. Agreed. Right. So. Well, how did you get interested in all these the children things, and what got you interested in politics? Uh, you grew up uh, in Mexico, so uh, briefly, and, and I have to say this, and, and it's not because I'm in front of you, but I just know to the, the law school what you've done and what your foundation has done was instrumental, mm -hmm. absolutely instrumental, um, and it's the difference between some kids, uh, you know, being here in the U.S. or being sent back and, and potentially murdered. So I, you know. What yeah. you've done has been instrumental to saving a lot of humans, and so I, I wanted to personally thank you for that. Yeah, and, and by the way, the, UN, the school has done a great job in following up with that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, and so I personally got involved in politics uh, my whole life. You know, my parents didn't have the privilege of an education. They came here. Uh, my family was born uh, right across the border from El Paso, Texas, in Ciudad Juarez. And when you think of Juarez, right, you, you, you about Netflix, it's all violence. Yeah. But there's a lot of humans that that are are just doing their best to, to mm -hmm. make it work every day. And that's my family, right? That's my parents, that's my uncles, my aunts. What, what did your dad do? Uh, so my father out there uh, did everything. He was a little kid that you would see on the border selling candy. He was that same little kid that was selling newspaper, who was later working uh, from job A to job B because he grew up in a household where unfortunately his father wasn't around. He was the eldest, so he became the man of the house at a very young age. He comes to the U.S. and he comes here with the, the, the reasoning that every other human comes here, to provide their family something better. My parents were very astute in saying, I don't know anything about that, but they always knew to point me in the right direction. So I grew up in, in a setting where I had people that didn't look like me, who looked like me, uh, who came from different walks of life, who were instrumental in, in really guiding me. And it's mentorship. I think most kids in our communities have the potential of being amazing. The problem is they just don't have that guidance. So I've devoted my life, really, ever since I was in high school, I was already in, involved in mentoring programs where we would go hang out with uh, middle school and elementary schools. And I've, I've continued to do that. That's always been my drive. I just always wanted to empower human beings because I felt that my story could have very easily gone in a different direction, but, but for the human beings that really stepped up to the plate. And I mean Republicans and Democrats. You know, I mean rich and poor. Just everyone you can imagine was instrumental. It took a, a village, as people say. So that, that was my thing. You know, I always tell people, you, the U.S. is the only country in the world where my father, when he first got here, you know, 1978, where he would ride a bike down Eastern Avenue from point A to point B to getting from one job to the other. And now in 2022, he can drive that same uh, avenue. He looks up and sees a building, which is our law office, with his last name on there. In one lifetime. This is the only country in the world, right? And so I know there's a lot of things we have to fix in this country. There's a lot of things we have to fix in this state. But it's still worth fighting for. It's still the greatest country on earth. And that's kind of my messaging. It's not that we've got it all figured out, but it's worth fighting for. And this is the only country in the world, by the way, where a parent with no education can raise a child to, to do whatever he wants. You know, my father became a, a, a U.S. citizen for the first time uh, just a few years ago. I was up in the legislature. And my dad voted for the very first time uh, during the past uh, presidential cycle. Mm -hmm. And I was his attorney. I did his immigration paperwork. You know? So those are the things that I, I like to remind folk and when, I, when I talk to our youth and when we do mentoring programs. It's like, we got this. We can do this. It's worth fighting for. And I think if that messaging continues, we're going to be okay. 
We just can't, we, we can't let a, a partisan badge be more important than the community. We can't, be a, we can't allow a partisan badge to be bigger than our kids, than our families. That has to be priority number one, and we'll be, the community will always be stronger that way. How will your role be different in the Senate than, has, than what it has been in the Assembly? Sure. You know, my commitment is very uh, community-focused. And what I mean by that is even my campaign, it's student-led. It's all student volunteers from El Dorado High School, Desert Pines High School, West Prep. And these kids are the campaign. Without them, the, the campaign doesn't exist. Uh, and I mention them because I, I want to take that sentiment and tone into the Senate where we're just empowering young students to realize that there's a space for them in politics. There's a space for them in this white-collar world. And then on top of that, I, I also, you know, my big push, my big commitment is I'm going to work with everybody. We can be small business owners and be pro-labor. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of drawing this, la uh, this line in the sand and this sentiment that you're either with us or you're against us. Cooperation is difficult. Negotiating is difficult. Having people who are on complete opposite sides of an issue sit at a table and be there for very long hours and finding that common ground is difficult. But that's what it takes. That's real legislation. That's, a, that's what a, a real uh, uh, elected official should be doing. And, you know, that's my commitment, that I, I want to bring folk together and we'll, we'll put in the long hours. Um, and I've said this even with law enforcement. You know, we want to take care of law enforcement. We want to make sure they have longevity. We want to make sure they're healthy. We want to make sure that they're getting all the benefits they deserve. And at the same time, we want to make sure they're well-trained, that there's transparency, that they're being held accountable. They're not mutually exclusive. And so I, I, that's what I bring into the Senate, and that's what I, I, try, I want to try to stay true to, that at every table you're going to have folk who would never be working and, and collaborating together, making that ta table as big as possible, and that we move legislation in this manner. His name is Edgar Flores. He's your assemblyman, mm -hmm. and now he's running for the state senate. November 8th, good luck. Thank you. I'm sure your dad's proud of you. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.